People who are psychologically warped that they cannot see something, even their own property, without wanting to steal it. <laughs> the so-called imperial presidency wants people to believe that at the head of the state is a man, but very rarely a woman, who can do and does everything. He appoints ministers, deputy ministers, a number of parliamentarians, permanent secretaries, deputy permanent secretaries. Provincial Police Commissioner, Directors in Ministries and all the Dolphin Cities, Judges and Magistrates, Ambassadors and High Commissioners, and all other state representatives, approves all new major uh, government uh, economic contracts, and oversees the economy, has the defense of security forces, and even decides the taxes to be used by the national soccer team. <laughs> of course, we know there is no one with all these capabilities or the mental or intellectual ability to discharge all these functions. Instead, we know that such powers, including more of them, that the big man grabs when he feels like it, leave a huge gray area for those around the throne to dispense favor, favors and cultivate their own clients and their own small empires. That is why it has become imperative in the wake of what the Kenyan process has delivered so far for all our countries to seriously interrogate these powers and their abuse and seek to seek a way in which a more collaborative leadership system can be evolved. There is no suggestion here of disrespect for our heads of state. We respect them, sometimes a bit too much, but we do not believe they are gods. And we have learned from our experience that absolute power not only corrupts absolutely, but also kills. One other area where we in our region may derive inspiration from uh, what has happened in Kenya is the handling of the balance of power between the central government and local government. A thorny issue in Kenya, I understand, since independence. In those absolute powers, hit on presidential shoulders is the appointment of individuals to head our administrative. One of those is the, uh, the appointment, the power to appoint individuals to head our administrative and political provinces and districts, which is a throwback from colonial times. It's encouraging that the Kenya process has put this issue in relief because it goes to the core of governance. All governance, like all politics, is local. And if we do not accede to the principle of effective devolution which gives our communities power to decide on matters that concern only them, we are negating the very idea of people's freedom to choose. Of course, it has not been easy for individuals in whose hands huge powers have been concentrated to voluntarily give them away in the spirit of benevolence and the desire to share. That is why, for the people to achieve the evolution, grim battles have had to be fought throughout history. And since, specifically, since the signing of the Mania Carta in the year 1215, elites at headquarters will not let go of their powers unless they are constrained, they are forced to do so. And in Kenya's case, we know, by concerted, and untiring political action. In Tanzania, the calls for devolution have largely fallen on, all, uh, on, on deaf ears, even though it is clear that the present system has failed to deliver development over the past half century. I have a profound fear that unless certain pressing governance issues are tackled with sincerity and imagination, including the devolution of power, Another 50 years will go by much the same way that the first half. Only the frustrations will be greater and the instability they cause more menacing. It's getting evident that all these presidential nominees whom the president himself may know nothing about are not necessarily dedicated to the districts or the, uh, the regions they are assigned to. And many discharge their duties as a matter of doing a job, no more. 
The allegiance lies with someone in Dar es Salaam, in the case of Tanzania, who seldom has time to check on how they are performing in their respective districts. At any rate, many of them get appointed as part of jobs for the boys and girls, a culture which tends to reward campaign managers, hatchet men, and yes, sweethearts. To expect any plausible performance from many of these characters is to expect blood from the cactus. They represent an anachronism and a statement of failure. They must go. Getting rid of this useless cadre of public servants will allow the Tanzanian people, at least in Tanzania, to have a share in their local communities, to share in the power in the local communities and districts, to periodically elect their governors at every level, to have uh, accountable individuals and councils which will be held to strict accounting for what they do and don't do, and who will be forced to seek re-election every so many years on the strength of their respective records and to make regions, provinces, and districts compete with each other in terms of effecting development programs. This kind of system has the, added, has the advantage of putting the destiny of communities in the hands of the very community, so that they cannot complain to headquarters for the non-performance of their elected governors. It has the added advantage of decongesting the corridors of government offices in Dagestan, full of frustrated little men and women who could have been happier as real leaders of power back home. I know that the logic of devolution, as stated earlier, dictates that Tanzanians, just like the Kenyans before them, will have to intensify their struggle on this front, and that devolution will not be handed down on a silver plate. So high are the stakes, and so reluctant those who benefit from the present uh, non-performing arrangement. But we have to continue fighting. Finally, constitution making. The growing and fast developing East African community has the opportunity to learn from Kenya's experience. As we continue to travel, on a long trajectory of harmonization of our systems to make them compatible. Issues of governance are already taking center stage and one day, the day may not be far off when we will have a political federation based on harmonized constitutional dispensations within our national borders, which then become easy to fuse into one supranational entity. Still, a number of obstacles have to be clear. Uganda and Tanzania seem to be intent on dragging their feet on constitutional reform with government parties continuing their stonewalling against any calls for change. As it is now, it is not even possible to predict when the sitting president in Uganda will eventually step down <laughs> and help free the political space that he has helped to constrict for so long. Likewise, in the Tanzanian context, much remains to be tackled, especially the present constitution written back in 1977, but still a derivative of uh, Lancaster, written in 1977 in order to facilitate a punctual exercise. In this case, it was the Union, the unification of the two parties, uh, Tanu and uh, Afro Shirazi Party, has become anachronistic in many ways and even contradictory in some. The frequent piecemeal amendments, cutted out from time to time to cure a minor ailment or expedite a given political development, often say things that contradict each other or certain other provisions in related. Uh, legislations. It is thus that between the constitution and related laws 
We have provisions that, for instance, deliberately undo gains that we thought we had already secured, such as a provision empowering, I hope it's not the government of Tanzania calling me, <laughs> such as uh, a provision empowering the president to nominate up to 10 members of parliament without following any process or referring to any criterion. Another makes it impossible to have a uh, makes it possible to have a president who may not have garnered more than half of the votes cast. As long as he is the first past the post, he has a simple majority. Such anomalies speak to the serious state of affairs where head of state conspires with a few acolytes around him to change a clause in the constitution in order to protect his political career but without regard to the damage such a move may have on the body politic and the future of constitutionalism. Arbitrariness of this kind denotes more than what we have been discussing concerning the imperial presidency. They speak to a tsarist regime where opacity rules. I believe that this is what Kenya has managed to a great extent to do away with. Your experience has taught us that constitution making is an extremely serious undertaking and one that requires the total dedication of a people, of a people solemnly determined to read its governance systems of unwanted arrangements put in place by people whose interests no longer cohere with the, with the real interests of the people. The process in Kenya has in effect amounted to a national self-interrogation through the campaign, through the, the referendum, and so on. A process of national self-interrogation. A soul-searching communion wherein demons were exorcised. Suspicions are sewaged, faiths united, and passions given rationality. <coughs> it has been exercised in self birth, in which the midwife and the baby, in a sense, are one and the same. Kenya has reinvented itself. To paraphrase Ngugi was young, having been dismantled and rendered fractious, the Kenyan people are remembering themselves, both in terms of recovering their memory of who they are, and also in terms of mobilizing all their constituent parts, their limbs, their organs of the whole nation to make it more than a collection of assorted tribes brought together by colonialism had the to serve colonial interests in London. <coughs> Even to hear some of these things said in the context of the new constitution and the whole process rings true to the ear. For rather than referring to the maternity home of your birth as Lancaster, whatever that means, Bombers of Kenya say something that really means something to the people of Kenya. I think this has been a true liberation. Of course, as they say, the devil is in the detail. The numerous laws that need to be enacted to operationalize the various constitutional provisions may provide yet another arena for political grandstanding and legalistic nitpicking. Nitpicking. No matter, for the baby is born, and the rest can now be taken care of. It is my hope that as we proceed on your journey, more East African and even African countries will be inspired by your example and that one day we will have constitutions that will have been crafted 
by the Africans themselves. That's 